Thanks for your attention. My name's Clive Miller, and this is our uh, interview series for Top Sales Performance. And today we're interviewing Lee Edge. Uh, now Lee's sales experience stems from initially 11 years at PwC, and then a stint at KPMG. Uh, he's a specialist in GRC, which is um, uh, governance, risk and compliance. Uh, and so I, I won't get into the details of what all that's about, because this is about sales. Uh, then he spent maybe a decade or so as an independent uh, consultant. And, and that can be quite challenging, selling yourself. So um, uh, and more recently, uh, Lee has joined um, Asin, who are uh, a startup company uh, who are helping financial institutions uh, with non-financial risk, if I've got that right. So um I'm going to get on to the uh, interesting bit. We want to hear from Lee about his sales secrets, really. So uh, um, my first question to you, Lee, is, is simply um, what are the what are the um, uh, what are the habits and practices that uh, you consider to have had the most impact on your sales success? Thank you, Clive. It's great to spend some time with you this evening. Uh, you got all of my background correct. So, um, but it has been the last seven or eight years I've been working in um, IRM, Integrated Risk Management Software Sales, or GRC Software Sales, um, and made that transition from the consulting from the big four um, about eight, eight, nine years ago now. So it's been an interesting transition. So what I picked up through that transition and some of the core things that you mentioned was, was really, first of all, the pipeline. Uh, something I didn't really utilize as a consultant that much, but you know, aiming for three times, four times ideally your pipe um, and getting that funnel or that hopper, depending on which, <laughs> which one you want to use, um, as full as you possibly can. And then qualifying that hopper uh, as early as possible to really, you know, to really drive that down or choke that aperture down to some qualified leads. Um, and to ensure that's done in, in the best way um, through the last three companies that I've been working with from a sales perspective, um, it always helps if you've got a BDE, a business develop, um, development executive, or you know that do, does the reach out and, and does those cold leads for you, um, as it's something that as a sales individual you're not paid to do that in my mind. There's usually a team of, of people that are there to, to reach out and do that. And in my last two, um, this company it works really well. The last two less so because they were bigger behemoths of companies and they, they really didn't have that nailed down. They really have an ace in so. Um, we've got two graduates, um, both, I mean, one from Oxford, one from um, Nottingham, I think, um, and they're doing really great work. And I've picked up a lot of the lingo very quickly, which is helping the sales team. So that Salesforce pipeline progression, up upside commit and all that kind of stuff well, it was, a, was a hard learn for me at the start because I'm not a detailed person, but ensuring that you have that information in there for your, you know, for the leadership team to, to understand where you are in your, your pipeline, but also really to help you push and challenge yourself on medic or med pick, depending on which one you use as a framework. I've thrown yeah, a lot in there, but answer question. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you mentioned medic, right? Some people watching, I guess, might not know what medic stands for. Um, do you know it off by heart? Well, I probably don't actually, but I know it starts with metrics, economic buyer and um, decision maker. And uh, what were the other ones? There's pain in there, which is the med pick one. Um, but I just, it always just goes in my head as medic, actually. But it's, it's, it's yes, really to yes. do with driving you through understanding the metrics you're working at, the economic buyer, who the key stakeholders are, you know, the, the insights, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the insights and the problems and the pain that they're suffering and, and ultimately, you know, how you can address that. So can I remember all of them? <laughs> no, not off the top of my head. <laughs> but, it's all right. I mean, if I ask anybody that question, almost everybody would have asked it as you did. So yeah, perhaps well, it even was like medic one place. <laughs> it's gone through so many. Um, it's been medic with one D, then it had medic with two Ds, then it was med pick. So people just keep adding letters on. <laughs> so you tend to forget. But it's handy. Yeah. I was going to ask a secondary question. Um, how did you learn to do these things? It was primarily, you know, mentors really. Uh, you know, in the big four. I think there's um, there's a great, I'm surprised to use the word great, there's a great development life cycle there in terms of career path, but there's a distinct lack in my experience of, of dedicated mentors. Um, you know, if you're in certain areas, you may find a few and you're quite lucky, 
but others are really you know they've got so much on the plate they're really dedicating um to ticking boxes to get promoted and get up that um, um profile within the big four but what i noticed in the sale industry is that because there's a collective drive towards those sales there's a little bit more time or, or desire for that mentoring because ultimately me as a salesperson is driving the, the vp of sales is um you know bonuses as well so being able to um you know leverage their understanding and their um experiences from a wider industry um, you know i was very much technology and information and communication in a big four and with the last 10 years i've gone into financial services so picking up the lingo and and really leveraging others to, to learn from them and not being afraid to ask stupid questions you know i'm working at asin now which is very much focused at um, investment banking at the minute and, and spinning out into retail insurance and asset management now but when it comes to the details of the investment banking with you know ficc you know equity markets debt markets and all those elements i've had to absorb those over the last few few months actually when i've transitioned into the sales role so it's really the mentor specifically that I've, I, you know, getting someone that you can learn from and, and respect. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so um, are there some things that you do every day that support your success? Yeah, and, and you know, I'll be transparent. It's, it's details, not something I've mentioned it already that is my strong point. Um, it's something I've had to work at. So I'm very much more, you know, strategic minded. I like talking about the the clients prospects challenges and needs but when it comes to actually driving those sales through the through the sales life cycle it's really getting into the into that detail which which i found tough but now i do it more um you know it's more ingrained in me that i actually you know go through that in the morning to find out where we are what the next steps are following up on those meetings and those nuances that all those little nuggets that they gave you and firing off some more information and emails internally to get additional information externally and internally and within the prospect company as well and um, just so you can hang it all together so i, I use um, mind map to pull it all together really that's something that i've found helps me um, and i know a few other people use them as well but it's quite an organic growth so you, you can leave it in salesforce you can leave it in your you know your quarterly reports to the leadership board or whatever but ultimately, if you've got one picture with all your notes and all your intel and all your, you know, prospecting and a key stakeholder map there as well, it all hangs together right on this screen in front of me. And I can just pivot around that on calls, before calls and after calls. So that's that's key to me. That's an application. Is it called Mind Map? I use XMind, which is a software that I've used for the last three or four years. Yeah. Um, you can share the maps and have teams utilize them and, and build into them. But you know, it's it's each to their own. So I've not really found that many team members to dip into the same mind map. So it has to be from a, a top-down kind of push if you want to utilize it across teams. Um, but I, I find it really useful. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. I mean, a lot of people do buy into mind mapping, and perhaps some viewers might say, "Oh, I'd like to try that." You know, so it, that's why I wanted to draw it out. Um, so, um, what mistakes have you learned to avoid in your sales career? Um, what have I learned to avoid? I think when I first joined RSA Archer as a subject matter expert slash sales, I was more of a, um, a go-to for GRC, as you mentioned before, governance, risk and compliance. The sales team around me had about five or six products they were trying to sell. And if they got a sniff of GRC, I would be the one to come in, sell it, run it. They would contract and I would move on. So, you know, I kind of got spun into sales pure and um, completely the following year uh, and I think I was a little bit naive in running for everything so that that's one of the key things that you know at the time I was like my strategic thing was like, I want everything and I can see opportunity everywhere even if that client isn't right for us there's a way we can utilize a partner and there's some of the software to create something um, and it took me a while to get out of that mindset really because well, actually, no, I was guided away from it by, again, you know, my, my mentor, which was my boss at the time. Um, and, you know, it took me a while to really understand why, um, because you may have good intentions. You may know what they're trying to achieve and you may have the, the nous and the technology and people around you to do it. But that's not what ultimately your core, core set of um, technology is about. So, you know, stick to what you're good at initially um, and then 
hit your targets. <laughs> so that's what I learned. With. That's the, the one mistake I've, I've learned to stay away from. Is, that's a good is not, one, yeah. going, not going too, too broad and trying to, you know, cook and boil the ocean, shall we say. Yeah, less is more. Yes. More qualified, more focused um, on, you know, and hit your target early. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you tell me something about um, the knowledge that you have that supports your success and, and how you came by it? Because, I mean, you know, being a specialist is, is, you know, how did you get to that level of capability and knowledge? It, it's, it's a really, really interesting story, really, and it's not going to be a long one. But I kind of fell into um, the, the big four. So, you know, my, my collective skill set, as I see it at the minute, is the fact that my main passion is, or was, and still is, sorry, uh, creative, you know, art, painting, illustrating, photography. Um, but I've also got the GRC book now as well, because I've been working on it for 21 years. But it allows me to kind of mold the two together, which is what I've really been trying to do over the last three years. And that creative element to the sales cycle and, and how, you know, how you can engage people through various events. Like, you know, like the, I mentioned the GRC Supper Club Peer Network that I run and stuff. So, you know, it, it's really the, you know, marrying those two together. But, you know, from my early days at PDBC, I didn't really know what I was getting into because it was sold as a global risk management um, solutions. It was called GRMS. So I was expecting to go in and be traveling the globe, looking at risk management from a strategic level. And I ended up going in and doing IT audit. And, you know, that wasn't me, still isn't me. So I'm not, you know, people that know me and if any of them are watching it will know me that, you know, it was a tough time for me trying to keep again in the detail and going out there and talking to people at the FT, Xerox, Time Warner around the, around the world about their systems and their processes. Uh, I remember being at the FT auditing a re revenue and receivable cycle and, you know, on a system that I'd know nothing about, but I'm interviewing somebody that's been there for 10 years managing that system. So... That really was being thrown in at the deep end, and and you were you know you were trained well, but then you were just sent off, and then had to manage those situations. So that although I didn't enjoy it for the first six or so years, um, as you got more senior and you travelled around the globe, um, you know with Time Warner, I was in the Asia, North America, uh, you know South America, you did just learn how to quickly understand systems and processes and controls and situations and be able to chat to different people in the hierarchy. So that over time just embeds itself within your DNA when it comes to, to selling. And when, as I made that transition you know, via KPMG to Archer and then, and then SAI and now ASIN, it kind of allowed me to create a consultative sale um, approach or zone, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, which is very much a trusted, um, a truly trusted advisor. I coined the TTA. I don't think that exists, so I'm going to copyright that. But really, <laughs> really being someone that is, you know, I'm selling stuff that requires a lot of time with a client and to understand their problems, and also proof of concept, proof of value, whatever, you, whichever term you want to use, or both. So it, it's more of a consultative approach to the selling side. I know there's various styles of selling. But I find within the GRC market and the, the time to sell is between eight to 12 months usually, it requires a lot more openness and transparency in terms of um, the software and what they need in that respect. Yeah, yeah it makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a journey, it was really a journey. I wouldn't be able to say I did this to get the knowledge that I have now. And you know, I, I work with um, two of the, the BDEs now that are in, just out of university. They're quickly picking up the lingo and, you know, I'm trying to get them to to make calls and, and hold conversations with CROs and they're doing a great job. But I know they're a bit nervous because the knowledge behind that facade takes many years to build up. And, you know, and yeah. I can help them where they need them. I am helping them. But I still feel that it'll take them a while to, to build up that. So experience comes with, with time. <laughs> yes, very <laughs> much so. Hair. <laughs> I think it was Malcolm Cladwell who wrote about the um, the ten thousand hours um, to become yes. an expert in anything. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think Beethoven had done that by the time he was eleven, right? So he <laughs> yeah. quickly ticked off those hours. 
but but in terms of, I think it was one of your earlier questions actually, and I, I was trying to pull it up before um, before the call. But somebody put me on to Jeffrey Gittimer's um, audio books as well, the Little Red Book of Sales, um, and I do remember reading those while I was. Uh, there's a few of them, I think, a Yellow Book, a Red Book, a Green Book. Um, I found those really useful. Um, and another one, another tool is or a book is the um, the Forty Eight Laws of Power, which is a bit more Machiavellian, but it's good to have the awareness of that because you can see that in people you're selling to, but also you can see it in your competitors and you can leverage it as well. Or you might want to use some of it as well. So I'll mm. leave that to to the discretion of the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> do you How many books per, a year do you read professionally? I don't actually keep track. Um, it, it varies, you know, with, with COVID and weirdly being sat here means you have less time to read because the moment you're up, you're sat here and which is a bit frustrating, but as I'm going back to London now and I'm having a bit more time, um, I think I, I probably read a non-fiction, more uh, work orientated or behavioral change, but probably about 10 a year. Uh, and then I probably do another 10 on fiction. So I flip between fiction and non-fiction. So I'm currently reading The Flash Boys, which is about the e-trading in the financial crisis, uh, which I'm finding really interesting. Um, and then I just finished a couple of um, Dumas books, so the first two in the Three Musketeer trilogy. So I like to mix it up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, well, like you, I, I like to use travel time or exercise time to to listen or read. And uh, yeah, okay. So let's. Um, uh, so what talents, skills, and methods? I, I tend to talk about talents being something you you kind of have a natural ability for a natural alignment with um skills to be something that you have to work at as in just the same as in sport really um and uh, methods to be things that um that uh, are procedural right so you, you can get repetition and consistency with them um so um the question sort of what talents um so it's three questions really talents skills and methods um, do you see as um uh, as being critical to success in sales? I think talents, <laughs> I could boil this down to Myers-Briggs, um, TMS, team management systems, you know, Carl Jung kind of um, research and all those kind of models that are out there now. And if you're a green, red, yellow or um, blue, in terms of if you're an analyst, if you're a driver, if you're you know more of a creative, or you're more of an emotional, um, it really depends which you know that you you can be one of all. So you, it's just your dominant more in one. I'm very much the the creative slash reps so a green red creative slash driver side, with with an element of the emotional, <laughs> and not much analytical. But it depends which area you are you are in that kind of um, sphere on each of those. I think those questions. So talent wise for somebody that is uh, outgoing, creative uh, or a driver, it tends to be presenting skills or talent for um, speaking in front of people. And it's something I always wanted to do. And they do say that, um, you know, if if you, there's a desire for, for you to do something, you tend to be a little bit scared. So when I was at the big four, I was always a bit nervous in, in big rooms. Uh, even though that I knew I wanted to be able to, you know, conduct that room and manage that room, but it was I would always put that pressure on myself. So I think there was a latent talent there. Others may disagree, but with the skill set I had to learn was really just pushing yourself out there and just doing it over and over again. And I heard that when I was young as well, and I was like, yeah, whatever. But actually, the best bit of advice to develop that skill that I ever heard was. If you're asked in a room of 30 or 40, like we had going around the table in the in PwC, and you're asked who wants to go first, you just stick your damn hand up and you literally go first and just go with it. And then, because everyone else is listen, listening to or thinking about themselves, they're not really listening anyway <laughs> until <laughs> they've gone. So the, if you go first, you've got half an hour of not stressing about it. And you know no one cares and you'll do a good job anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And the more you do that and you more even in like workshops, training or anything or, you know, being the sales individual, the lead salesperson doesn't there or doesn't want to do it. Just go ahead and do it and just take the lead. And you'll be surprised how quickly you just get used to awkward silences and just go, you know, just playing on it 
using it as a joke or playing on it or building on that pause and being able to pivot in the conversation uh, is just that that's the skill that i've worked on methods wise uh, i would think really you know that we've mentioned medic or med pick this force management is a method that we use the rsa archer which is understanding positive business outcomes negative business outcomes um, although there was about 200 pages of information there what i got out of it was a really interesting method um, in, in how to manage um, uh, conversations with stakeholders. We've recently done another one internally at ASIN called Challenger. So I think that's quite well known out there as well. So, you know, again, it's all about challenging. The biggest thing for me in that method was ramping up the tension. I'm very much, um, as, you, as people listening may have seen already, I like to play a soft approach, quite, um, you know, welcoming and make as many jokes as I can, whether or not they're funny, I'll leave it to the, <laughs> to the individual <laughs> I'm speaking with. But, um, but ten, you know, tension is always something that is really difficult to build, especially over the new COVID webinar approach, you know, but taking somebody at a prospect to the, almost to the breaking point, and that's not what I'm condoning, but just ramping up their, you know, them a little bit by challenging them on if they know what they're doing and if they've seen this in the market and then pulling it back. That's a difficult skill and method to, to, to work on. Yeah, so that's interesting. The it's interesting because many, many years ago, they had a program at Intel called Management by Confrontation. Right, which, okay. Which was somewhat similar. But uh, yeah, I know the challenge of it. It's very good. Yeah, yeah there's okay. a lot of you know, that, Well, dialing up that tension bit was an interesting one for me because I'm still not completely sold it's, it's the thing to do. But as it's a skill um, I'd like to work on, it's something I thought I need to give it a go and, I, and it, I need to probably utilize it to a certain level, not to where they were saying, but to my own understanding of where the level should be, um, rather than trying to be a friend all the time. It's, you know, I do yes. think that's the best way myself, but with an element of that challenge and that tension, it, it proves and that you know what you're talking about. And, you know, I, you know, I, I feel it's a good thing to have in your golf bag or whatever. Yeah, it's about being able to make a difference, isn't it? I think. That's yeah, good. you know, and, and, yeah, it is. Well, it was the, I've always played on the trusted advisor, like I mentioned before, which is the same thing, but without annoying them uh, or, you know, or putting them in an awkward situation. I'm still unsure about whether you need to do it that far, but if you can add that element of tension to the consultative questioning, I think you can achieve that without making them sweat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a middle ground there which I'll be able to nail soon. Um, but it's definitely an interesting skill and method. To yeah, use. I, guess, I guess it depends on how you interpret what the trailer says or what the training says. Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's kind of a similar question, but um, I'm try trying to sort of dig down. So um, what do you see as the character traits and qualities that you consider important to, uh, factors for success in sales? Character characteristics. I've worked and seen many, many different characters over the last, excuse me, eight years in um, the sales roles that I've been doing. Um, and all successful to varying degrees. But the main three that I can think of, and I won't name names because I don't want them to know that I think they're successful. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, but no, in terms of the, the successful three I'm thinking about, it was that laser focusedness. Fo I can't say the word laser focusedness yeah. that they yeah. had, and you know, one specifically would be really um, would ghost as a new word from the streets. He would, he would ghost a lot of the emails in, from internal admin and all the all the kind of like um, event or requests for information internally, and would you know now and again show up at internal meetings. You know, meeting noise, internal admin noise, really pains me. Because I think from the big four days, I'm all about efficiency. So when I see inefficiency, it really, really riles me, to be honest. So I think they did, the three of them did really well about stepping back from that. Not annoying the leadership team, but stepping back enough that they didn't get too wedded into the conversations and the email trails. Or the, the Microsoft Teams millions of chat that you have nowadays. So, you know, that was one of the good characteristics that I saw. And then they were always out with the clients. Very difficult now. But one guy used to take a birthday cake um, round to when he knew people at his prospects and clients were, it was their birthdays at various levels within the company, only small ones. 
but at least he had that personal contact and, and you could tell he was a sales guy you know I'm, I'm not I'm sure they, they they saw through him a little bit but he he was really personable with it and um, you know very um, just very open to everyone within that company when he was there uh, and then other characteristics vary but you have the, the the consultative let's help you you also have I just sell software so it's it's two different ways you know I'm, I'm selling tin I want to sell as much as I can and I don't care how I sell it but we're gonna do a deal for you deal for me and we'll just bundle it together and we'll get it over the line whereas the the, the opposite side is we'll what problems have you got uh, let's demonstrate the value before you sell it so it depends on the product yeah um, but ultimately I think it's tenacity and um, not you know not being knocked back from people or, uh, you know, mentioning negative things about your software or the competitors offer this. And then so, you, you know, some people would drop their price. It's all about holding that price. So it's a belief in yourself and the product and a bit more a bit of tenacity, I'd say. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, OK, so um, if you had to distill all this into one piece of advice, I know that's quite challenging. Uh, because you've gone you've covered an enormous amount of ground in the sort of 35 or so minutes we've been talking um, so if you had to distill this into one piece of advice um, for a newcomer um, what would it be if they're from a background of consulting and they have that knowledge then the advice would be really just to to get your your head into the bonnet of the sales cycle and frameworks and really understand why and even if you think you've got it, just keep asking questions about it for the first few months until you, you know, it kind of sinks in more than you thought it already had, uh, or it, more than you think thought it had, um, because that's something that took a while for, for me to grasp, really. Um, probably about 12 to 18 months uh, until I really got hold of that. Um, and then if you're not from a consultative background, but you understand the sales approach, where you can sell eyes to Eskimos and all that kind of stuff, my advice would be really understand the subject matter. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're a trusted advisor or, and just a pure sales, you both need to come to the middle and have a bit of that mixture to, to sell nowadays. Uh, I think people can see, I've just watched um, a couple of movies on the financial crisis uh, over the last few weeks, actually. And there was Free Fall by the BBC. Um, and Dominic Cooper was in it. And he was a... Um, a mortgage salesperson when they were selling you know cdos wrapped up in all that kind of stuff and you know bad debt mortgages and he was just going out there and just getting everyone just to tick and buy and buy and buy where there was another chap in the office um who was actually oh god what's his name he's off game of thrones um it'll come back to me it, it's the singer's son I, I can't remember alfie alfie whatever it doesn't matter but um, right. he wasn't selling that many but he had more ethics to him so his conduct and ethical approach was there, but he was in the wrong industry at that time because they were pushing all these bad mortgages. So he wasn't doing that well and succeeding in, in work. So I think nowadays there's a middle ground with ethics on one side and sales on the other, where um, a lot of, from what I've seen, prospects and potential clients can see through a lot of um, smoke and mirrors. So I think they're getting a bit more educated themselves. So it's understanding that. And I don't think you're going to sell without being trustworthy to a certain level. I agree entirely. I think establishing trust is an important part of it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Lee. Um, I think it's been a fantastic uh, interview. Uh, you've covered lots of ground and offered some really good advice and given some details about the resources that you've used and the books you've read and so on. So um, thanks for all of that.